Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Smells Like Business, a podcast for anyone who wants to learn more about the current and future state of cannabis in Europe. Every episode we talk to different business owners and cannabis specialists, making it easier for you to enter and better understand the cannabis industry. I'm your host, Tom, and on this episode, we have Marin Krings on the show. She is an environmental photographer and hemp advocate from Thuringia, Germany. She uses her photography to focus on the social and environmental issues that are arising due to the climate crisis. Since 2016, she has been traveling the world investigating and documenting over 200 different hemp projects with sustainable practices. We discuss what some of these hemp projects are getting up to and how they can help address at least some of the environmental issues we face today. Marin is also currently working on a book, compiling and bringing together everything she has learnt and documented about hemp in the last five years. She kindly shares with us what the book will be about as well as her creative process of how she is compiling, editing and narrating everything she has documented. We also take a little look into what Europe is doing to further develop the hemp industry, as well as how important creativity can be as a powerful medium for advocacy. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi, Marin. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you, Tom. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here. Oh, it's a real pleasure. I'm very happy that uh, Herbrandt from the Hemp Hash and Marijuana Museum in Amsterdam connected us. But yes, before we begin properly, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up on this epic journey documenting hemp and the different ways it can be applied from, well, all over the world. Absolutely. So my name is Marin Krinks. I'm a German documentary photographer and a climate impact storyteller. I love that word because it so sums up what it is that I'm really burning for. And I would say it was a little bit the the dooms and glooms of our nowadays time that really got me into this hemp story. Going back, I would say in the very beginning when I started being a photographer, it was a passport to the world. So that was, you know, like 17, 18 years ago. And that definitely changed for me because nowadays I would consider photography to be a very powerful tool for myself in regards to what it is that I want to tell. But also, I think, in regards to what's happening in our world, you know, with COVID, with the climate crisis, it's interesting because for some reason, we're always trying to explain what's happening nowadays in numbers. And numbers, unfortunately, don't really create any emotional picture within people. And I'm taking this quote a little bit from somebody I interviewed for the book who said, you cannot describe a crisis in numbers. And he gave that wonderful example that if a lion stands behind a tree and is ready to attack you, nobody's going to tell you the likelihood of percent that might be applying to you surviving this, but somebody's going to just scream at you, run. And I think that really brings it together that, you know, trying to tell what's happening nowadays in images is much more powerful than referring only to the numbers. And I'm not saying that we do not need the numbers, but the numbers need amplification in something that really touches people's hearts and, let's say, beyond the head only. Yeah, absolutely. I think that emotional attachment can sometimes go a lot further than numbers. But yeah, so you've been working on this project, documenting hemp around the world for the last five years, since 2016. When you first started, did you know how big it was going to get? Was it your intention from day one to travel the world, to photograph and document all these different hemp projects? Unlike many answers where I can't give a clear and short answer, this is a clear no. I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into when this journey started. And I would also claim that I never really made that decision to become an advocate for hemp but it was more the plant actually finding me. I think if I were to try to describe that correlation in a story, then I would say hemp became a little bit like a business partner in a social mission. In 2016, when I set out, you know, I had sort of accomplishment in my life in terms of having just published my third book, and I just wanted to get out into the world and see what's happening. That was at the height of the refugee crisis. And this is when... 
hemp snatched me and i'm saying it like this because i never intended on documenting hemp but i stumbled over it when i was in south tyrol in italy and had like a 30 minute pep talk from somebody who is really engaged with hemp and who told me about textiles building materials food medication anything hemp and all i thought in my head was uh-huh that's really interesting especially when you're somebody who's interested in environmental topics This just sounds a tidbit too perfect to be real. And I guess Werner Schönthaler, who was the man who introduced me first to hemp, he really kicked off the investigative journalist in me and kind of made me doubt everything he said. And by doubting everything he said, I set out and, and started searching for the answers. If his speech was wrong, then I needed to get the facts to deliver why he was wrong. But I didn't really find much that he was wrong about. I just found even more that catapulted me into continuing to research about hemp and really finding those people who were dealing with hemp. And I would very clearly say that it was the first half year of researching and investigating hemp as a newcomer. I had no idea that this was going to be such a never-ending and five-year <laughs> journey. I mean, I think that's amazing. You just stumbled over hemp. And after a 30-minute talk with this guy in Italy, it set you on this path for the next five years. So what did you see? What was out there? I'm very curious to hear how people are actually using hemp in different corners of the globe. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as my journey started in Europe, I just want to shortly refer to Europe as it's kind of the small-scale patchwork hemp history where Every country has a teeny tiny bit of a different focus. One country is a bit more ahead in the building sector than the other country is more ahead in the paper sector. But then it was interesting to see that jump going to the US and Canada and seeing that you have the, the medical field being so much further developed. At the same time, I found it very funny to see that despite the fact you have so many states in the United States that already legalized marijuana, you still couldn't do anything with industrial hemp. Yeah, that cracked me up, to be quite frank, because I kind of go over to America and feel, okay, now I'm going to open my eyes to the big games. And then you see that they might be ahead on, on one thing, but then basically at the disadvantage of something else entirely. But leaving the stage of, let's say, the uh, mainstream hemp developments, which I would say is US and Europe, it was quite interesting for me to venture into the Baltic region. A project that's really close to my heart is Christaps Eglitis. He is the inventor of the Herdmaster, which is a tiny, basically a tiny decorticator. When I say tiny, it fits in a car, and that's the lovely thing about it, because he invented this machine to basically help those people who grow hemp to really do build a zero-kilometer house, because that way they can just put that machine next to the field, start decorticating their hemp, having the chives, and then continuing to build their house. And he basically comes from a technical and steel welding background. So it was a possibility for him to really invent that machine where he took a machine that was existing but not very efficient and then basically modified it, eventually actually coming up with a whole new uh, machine that was much smaller and much more efficient. And it was so amazing, you know, you're traveling through the entire world and here I was given his name and his number or email address. And it was literally set up in three days. I was ready to leave for my big journey to Mongolia via train. And then this contact with Chris Epps came up right before. And he said, well, if you're already up this way, then why don't you just come by? And I was invited by his entire family. And I have rarely ever experienced such a heartful welcome from complete strangers. And that is something that I really carry in my heart because these hemp connections are something very special. But, you know, moving on, then there's also these projects, for example, hemp paper as a topic that I find extremely, extremely important because that's something that started for me very early on when I knew I was going to make a book about this entire experience and story. I had it set in my head that I wanted to print this book on hemp paper. Of course, then you start researching, okay, where do I get hemp paper? And you realize, hmm, that is... It's not that easy. You name it, exactly. So funny enough, I mean, as a German citizen, the two companies that I found producing hemp paper came from Germany. So we have Hahnemühle 
fine art paper and we have Gimund paper. And these were the two companies that I could find within Europe that were actually producing it. Because, of course, you know, it gets a bit untraceable because these paper companies produce the hemp paper and then, of course, the marketing is done by somebody else. The distribution is done by somebody else. So it took me a while to trace down that all of this hemp paper was actually coming from one or two sources. And then, you know, obviously it's it's extremely expensive and I couldn't really figure out why hemp is roughly said it's three times more expensive than regular good paper and i'm putting an emphasis on good because you don't really print photography books on any newsprint <laughs> paper and uh, so the paper already is quite expensive for photography books but you know adding another threefold on that for hemp was just a barrier that I can't really easily jump over as an artist and I tried and I kept researching and that sort of unfolded a whole story in itself. I think the topic of hemp paper could probably be a tiny book <laughs> just by itself. And then you kind of go back to, okay, why is it so expensive? And then you realize, okay, there's very few factories that actually produce the raw material. So yeah, the paper topic was quite interesting because then it also got me really close to the indigenous communities of Scandinavia, namely the Sami indigenous people, because they're fighting very hard for their forests that are being depleted by the paper industry indirectly, meaning the forest companies that just do clear cutting to then bring that raw material in for the paper making. And seeing that at the same time as I'm trying to figure out why hemp cannot gain any ground in the paper industry was sort of that aha moment. So yeah, this is definitely a really interesting topic. And then another one that I personally find quite huge in the hemp world is the topic about plastic. I mean, something we've all heard about is hemp plastic. And really, this word in itself should just be forbidden. Because it just creates wrong images in people's heads. And here we are back to the storytelling. When you hear hemp plastic, you obviously believe that there is a sort of an equivalent to plastic that can be made entirely 100% from hemp. And from all the experts I spoke to, I now know that this is clearly impossible because you can't make any soft plastic from only hemp because you will always need softeners to be put into the biocomposite. And I think this would be the word that we should choose, hemp biocomposite. That's technically the correct naming. And if we were to call it that, I think we'd already cut out a lot of the myth that's circulating around the hemp plastic topic. So... Yeah, these these were like sort of, you know, three things that came to mind. Of course, there were further amazing explorations and discoveries I did, for example, in Mongolia and in Turkey. Mongolia was quite interesting because there everything is totally in the making because the country still has banned hemp completely. I mean, if you if you're caught you know, in any combination to anything hemp, you'll literally go to jail. And yet there's a very young startup company in Mongolia that's trying to really educate the government, educate the doctors, educate professors on the differences between marijuana and hemp, meaning industrial hemp. And when I say that, we should keep in mind that in Mongolia, hemp does grow wild. So it's one of the birthplaces of hemp. And, you know, there's a huge potential because they could be tackling so many of the air pollution problems, of the health problems that are caused by the heavy air pollution in the capital. They could be uh, tackling the problems of housing, you know, having the world's coldest capital where temperatures drop below minus 40 degrees in the wintertime. You do want to make sure that housing that's being built has some decent and very good insulation to make sure that the heating can be kept at a minimum. Meaning right now people mostly live in yurts or gears, which is like a felted tent. And to keep that warm in times when it's minus 40 degree outside, they put anything in their fire. They burn old car tires, they burn raw coal. And of course, this is all going at a toll of the environment. That is one of the projects that really intrigues me. I mean, imagine you're living in a country where the potential that you end up in jail for years to come are as big as anything and yet you're going through the in strenuous work of educating your own government to change things i mean that's true pioneer work absolutely and it's the plant that grows naturally there 
But it's really interesting because it seems like you're really documenting and witnessing some very interesting and quite diverse projects from grassroots movements like here in Mongolia to actual big industrial applications that are already implemented. But yeah, let's bring it a bit back closer to home. So do you think Europe is actually doing enough to help develop the, the hemp industry? Europe, of course, is a very, maybe not in, in geographical size, it's not big. But Considering the many different countries and governments we have within the European Union, as well as I want to open this up to the European geographical continent, it becomes vast. It becomes extremely difficult because you have so many different regulations on such a small, tiny you know, land mass that it becomes hard because when, for example, France has much more hemp growing than a lot of the other countries in Europe. By far, I heard, actually, by quite a mile. Yeah, and there's a historical reason to it, because uh, hemp never really was forbidden in, in France. So the French people always continued their cultivation of the hemp agriculture. And, of course, also the French agricultural system works a little bit different, because they have these cooperatives of farmers, which, for example, in comparison to Germany, doesn't exist. In Germany, every farmer basically acts for him herself which means they kind of look for what's the cash crop of the next year, and that's what I'm going to grow because I want to earn and have to earn money with what I do. In France, the farmers really commit for 10 to 15 years to what they will grow on these fields. Hence, of course, an industry can build up much better because they know they will get their raw material. Yeah, and it's providing longevity, isn't it? And then, of course, power in numbers as well. Exactly. If you take an industry, you need the raw material to run it. So if I have very, very few farmers plant hemp and I cannot really establish a sort of efficiency on a decortication line, well, then it's going to be impossible for me to really build up that decortication line. And that's one of the things that I see completely missing in Europe. What's happening is that in Europe, the individual hemp characters seem to be more focused on their personal success in being a pioneer for A, B, C, D, whatever it is that they're on to inventing. And I cannot tell you how many harvesters I've photographed over these five years that were special inventions by <laughs> such and so forth. You know, so basically everybody is inventing merely the same thing instead of communicating with each other and making sure that there might be one pot of finances that will, you know, deliver for an invention that everybody can use open source. Yeah, it is a shame because it really could be an answer to so many of our environmental issues at the moment. And it sounds like we're not lacking inventors or engineers or people that, you know, have the drive or the will. But it seems like there's no system in place to scale up. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's move on and actually talk a bit about the book, because obviously you've been on this project and now you're bringing it all together and creating a book. So maybe you could tell us a bit about it without, of course, giving away too much. <laughs> I will try. What you can probably hear from me saying that is it's extremely complex and it's pretty easy when you set out on such a spur of the moment. I never had written a project proposal or an, a draft to this project before I left because obviously I didn't know I was going to work on this. So as hemp sort of kept interfering my path of doing other things, it was sort of like a gradual process of readjusting and readjusting until eventually I said, okay, well, I'm, I keep going back to hemp, so this is going to be my topic now. And then due to the COVID time, I really had that confined space of having to sit down and think. And I realized I had gotten completely lost in this huge story because as you can imagine, 200 projects that I documented, it's pretty easy to get a separate story out of each one of these documented projects. And now the question is, how do you pull it all together? And looking at a data bank of 72,000 images and several I think almost 100 hours of audio and video footage just brought me to a point of panic. And I was very, very fortunate due to a masterclass with Lens Culture in Amsterdam that I took uh, from October 2019 until March 2020. I first ever heard about the terminology of a story doctor. 
And hearing this, I immediately thought, oh my god, whatever a story doctor does, it sounds like it's something I need right now. <laughs> so a story doctor basically is a person who, in my case, Pauline Bakker, who's my story doctor, she is an author and a journalist, but she also comes from a psychological background. So she was incredibly good during our mentoring sessions to really seek out my mind and listen to the keywords that kept popping up, you know, circular economy, hemp to mitigate the climate crisis, but then from there go deeper and say, okay, how, why, when, where, now let's get you organized. And she really helped me break this entire project down into digestible bits. And she helped me also with something that was probably the hardest part of this entire journey to say goodbye to a lot of projects, because obviously you can't make a book with 72,000 images, but saying goodbye to any of these images that obviously are so emotionally attached to, and I think that's a general problem that anybody, not just photographers, also filmmakers and probably also authors have, is let go of something you have produced and say goodbye to something that you are emotionally so attached to. And uh, that's really what Pauline helped me with, or is still helping me with. And the book will contain four storylines. And these four storylines are in existence now because there's these different parts that really don't necessarily go together. So I did very scientific work in terms of doing these expert interviews. This was partially scientists who write IPCC reports. These were partially scientists who are doing product development, who are coming from the environmental sectors or sustainability backgrounds. And this was very, very much the number talk that I got. And the numbers are good, we need them, but then the question is, how do you integrate them into your entire work? Because, you know, I can't claim as a photographer that I came up with the numbers, I would never want to do that because I didn't. But I'm the one who has to come up with a translation between the numbers and the according images that make sense on an emotional basis so people can get it. So we have that storyline of the expert interviews that's a lot about facts and a lot about the background knowledge to the entire hemp industry. At the same time, I'm trying to get engaged story edits in the visuals that will get people going. I want people to get off the couch and wanting to be ready to go on creating these changes that we need to see in order to really tackle the climate emergency or climate crisis or whatever you want to call it. And the last part of storyline is definitely my own journey. And I think that was something that I had to declutter because when I started, I could clearly see that the first year of documenting hemp, I was still in that fascination of what you can do from and with hemp versus then slowly moving on. The plan really helped me to awaken to the climate crisis in terms of not just counting down the numbers and reciting mantra like any IPCC report and saying we need to do something because the numbers need to have by then and we need to be carbon free by then. But understanding what this actually means, seeing the thawing permafrost, driving in a train through Russia over a period of time where we seriously went from wildfires threatening people's lives to an entire strip of land drowning in water. And going, wow, I've been sitting on the strain for 11 days and all of this is happening at nearly the same time. What's happening around me? And these weather extremes, you know, that's one part. But then also seeing how people adjust to it or not adjust to it because they're completely overwhelmed by the rapid changes of the climate and just not having the time to adjust organically to what's happening. There's a lot to digest there. But it sounds like you have things under control and you've got your story doctor to help you bring these separate stories into one cohesive book. But yeah, I only have a few more questions for you. We're getting closer to the end now. So what advice would you give to other photographers or any creative souls for that matter who want to use their talent and skills to advocate or send a message out to the world? Well, I think the most important thing to realize for any creative person in whatever field they are creative in is whatever it is you output will have an influence and an input on somebody. I do believe that we need to be very aware of what messages we bring out there, especially nowadays. As you in the beginning said so well, we're living in a very polarized world. 
And anything we do and make can be interpreted in many different ways. And I think considering first what it is that you stand for in life will also help you greatly in what you will produce in life. For me, it was very clear that humanity is important to me. I do care about people. And that was also something that's becoming more and more valid in my work, in my commercial work, because I'm actually starting to back away from certain commercial jobs where I just feel like if they are impactful, they're they're doing a different impact than the one that I would actually like to create. And at the same time, to me, the purpose in my life seems to be becoming more and more important. I just simply do not want to waste my time with things that I don't care about. If you're a creative mind or a person, then find yourself that topic that really gets you excited. That's pretty much the best advice I could give any creative person. I also have another question about advice. So what advice, now having seen hemp being used in so many different ways, would you give to an entrepreneur who, who wants to dive into this wonderful industry? I would say to anybody who's becoming intrigued and inflicted with hemp, do make sure to invest some serious time in doing your homework. So make sure you scrape beyond the surface. And I would really, really, really like to make a call out. I want people to listen to this podcast and turn around afterwards and say, okay, I am going to tackle the problem of building up paper pulp supply from hemp in Germany, in England, in wherever. We need people to get busy on the stuff that has not been overpopulated in the hemp industry. Yeah, absolutely. And I think hemp paper, what a great place to start. Great. So I have one last question, which I ask all my guests, and that is, if you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? Yeah, well, let's put it this way. Can I challenge you back on that question? Because, of course, we can always go back in our own lifetime and contemplate if there's anything to change. But I think more effective might be to just get up every morning and try to be a better person than you have been the day before. At least that's my mission. So I don't necessarily want to go back in my own lifetime, but... If I could be beaming myself back in history, I would love to go back to 1764. I'm being very specific here. Yeah, I'm going to write that date down. 1764. Let's see what this is all about. That was when the spinning jenny, the cotton spinning machine was invented. And I would love to travel back in time with all of the knowledge I've gathered right now about the you know detrimental environmental effects from our modern industries. Go back to 1764 and see if the spinning jenny would have still been the invention of our time. Because basically that set the stage for cotton, cotton plantations. We know that they salinate the soils, they bring desertification to already very dry areas. They, I could continue and continue now, you know, pesticides, herbicides and everything. I would love to see if hemp would have left the stage if then we knew what we know nowadays. Because I think, quite honestly, in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, things would have gone quite differently if we would have foreseen the environmental impact that our modern economies, namely, you know, through the Industrial Revolution, have taken on our planet. Yeah, definitely. If we could have gotten in there early with that message before the Industrial Revolution really took off, it would be very interesting to see where we would be now. Yeah. Great. So where can our listeners find out more about you and what you're doing? My website is basically my full name with a dot com at the end. It's marinkrings.com. And those who are very active on social media can definitely find me well on Instagram. There you find me under Marin Krings Photography. That's where I most of the time post quite frequently about anything that's hemp, about anything that's the environmental works that I do. Great. Well, thank you so much, Marin, for being on the show. It's been a wonderful chat. I've enjoyed it very, very much. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. I really like the questions that you asked. They were very deep and really challenged me to go beyond any superficial talk on this topic. Great. Well, that was Marin Krings, who I just want to thank for the kind words and for sharing her lovely story and amazing insights into what's going on with hemp around the world. 
do make sure to check out her website, marinkrings.com. That's M-A-R-E-N-K-R-I-N-G-S. Please do remember to check out our website at smellslikebusiness.com and subscribe to our newsletter. I've been your host, Tom. Have a green day, everyone. Business. Smells like business.